Well, the FBI is obviously focused on the motive for this attack. Not much has leaked out to the rest of us. Fox's Catherine Harridge has been on it all day, and she joins us now uh, in the studio. What are you hearing, Catherine? Well, two of our contacts, Tucker, have seen uh, the inventory of the weapons that were recovered, and they're telling us that everything he had between the hotel and the residences was real high end. They told us that there were AR 15s, uh, AR 10s, uh, with a costing between $1,500 and $3,000. And when you add uh, the scopes and the tripods, you're looking at an invest in, investment, pardon me, of over 100,000 case. So this guy <laughs> made a significant financial investment, much more of an investment that was really necessary that's right. to carry out. It's almost an exaggeration or a caricature of what would have been required. Because that's, that's a number of times what a conventional AR-15 costs. They're very mm -hmm. cheap right now. So is there any inkling of why he would have wanted high-end weapons? There's no inkling about the why, but we're getting a better sense of the timetable for the purchases. Some of these weapons were purchased back in June. So if you take that as a data point, it suggests there was some level of premeditation as far back as the summer, if not before. And the sheriff Lombardo said at the news conference today that based on the arsenal that he had, it took significant premeditation. But you're right to note the fact that it's almost um, overcompensating, if you will, right? Because yes. there was no way he could have used all these weapons or the ammunition that he had in the hotel and then to make such a significant investment also in the planning. From different manufacturers, apparently there were nine separate manufacturers, which itself is very uh, odd. Finally, ISIS, as you reported yesterday, has taken credit for this guy in two different press releases. It was dismissed sort of by federal authorities. But they seem to leave a little bit of wiggle room there. Do we know anything? I mean, there's a little bit of daylight uh, there. What jumps out to one of my contacts who does a lot of collection of social media uh, from ISIS and al-Qaeda for the government is that it's unusual for them to really double down on a claim. For ISIS to double yeah, down. Yeah. They've made bogus claims in the past. Do you remember back in June? There was the attack on the casino in the Philippines, and yes. they claimed that, but in fact, it was just a bunch of, of criminals who were responsible for that. But it's unusual to see that kind of doubling down, and then no obvious proof of contact or evidence or a photo that would allow them to say, see, this is our guy, or this is us Skyping with our guy. So everything about the case, as you just said with your last guest, it's just, it's really squirrely to yeah, use a technical term, right? I don't believe it for right? a second. Yeah. A 64-year-old man, had, there's no evidence of digital communications for him. I just don't believe that. Yeah. Catherine Harris, thank welcome. you for the latest. Dozens of guns, cash sent abroad, no manifesto. How do all the facts fit together and what should investigators be looking for? Terry Turchi is a former FBI deputy assistant director. He helped lead the hunt for the Unabomber out in Montana and he joins us tonight. Mr. Turchi, thanks a lot for coming on. So you bet, Tucker. What piece of the string would you be pulling if you're running this investigation right now? I would definitely be interested in knowing what the uh, girlfriend is saying. I'd want to get her back here as soon as possible. Uh, I think that's uh, very important because she's the one who's going to know what he was doing in June and July and uh, how he's been evolving over the last year or however long she's known him. So that's very important. Also, in this case, it's even more important because, quite honestly, nothing is making sense based on what we know about prior cases and prior subjects like this. It's very important that the uh, authorities in Las Vegas do exactly what they seem to be doing, which is following the trail, staying on the trail of the forensics, the crime scenes, the actual operational part of the investigation, the variety of special projects, doing all, all the things that you might say are kind of routine, but they're really not, finding out where every camera is located, getting all the film, trying to find uh, people and witnesses both inside and outside the perimeter of the crime scene. All those things are the things that are uh, factual. The information you get is fact, and eventually all of those things and all of those facts end uh, at an intersection where you answer the question that everybody's asking, what was the motive? But if you don't stay on that trail and you start getting into all kinds of theories, because we could sit here now and talk for an hour and we could probably come up with a hundred theories. Right. Every one of those, if investigators started worrying about them or getting sidetracked, they would end up uh, somewhere in a swamp. So they have to be really focused on that trail that I, uh, I always like to call well, it. Well, here's an actual fact. I mean, obviously nobody is farther from the profile in your mind's eye of an Islamic State operative than Stephen Paddock. He just doesn't look like the guy. But the fact is their press office twice laid claim to him. So what do you make of that? Do you dismiss that out of hand? Should it be dismissed out of hand? Should it be followed up on? What are, what are federal investigators doing with that? 
Well, Tucker, I've learned never to dismiss anything out of hand, and so are the people that are working this. And so the way you handle something like that is, again, you, you seek facts. You go to an entire national security apparatus of people who know ISIS, of people who are following that aspect of things every day to keep us safe. And you talk to them about what's going on. You have them on the task force that's working on this. And every day is different. So they're going to come in every day with updates and information and, and help you try and figure out and kind of navigate your way through this. In addition to that, uh, all of these search warrants that are being served, and this man had multiple pieces of property, he had cars, he had all kinds of things. They're, they're going to look for something. And again, he's not the normal guy so far, but if he is kind of the normal guy, guess what we're going to find? We're going to, I mean, the normal uh, shooter, the normal terrorist type loner. What we're going to find are journals. We're going to find something right. where at least for himself, he was keeping notes and he was, he was kind of telling everybody in the world what was going to happen. And so you're always on the lookout for that kind of thing. Hopefully we'll find those kinds of things and can, uh, it'll shed some light on, on well, where we are and how we well, got here. That's right. If he recorded his murders, you can't convince me he didn't leave previous, previous records of what he was thinking. That's really smart. Terry Churchy, thank you. Very good point. You're welcome. Appreciate it.